your host, Bill Real. Welcome to the first episode of the Almost Awakened podcast. I'm your co-host, Bill. And I'm Mikkel. And we are excited to have you with us. Super excited. Thanks for being here. The name Almost Awakened, why did we choose that, Bill? The name Almost Awakened, um, you and I went back and forth for quite a while trying to come up with a name for this podcast. Uh, my two cents is that you and I, we'd like to pretend we're awakened. Right. But, th- but the honest truth is we're almost awakened. <laughs> I agree. I agree. I was looking up the definition and even just thinking the last couple of weeks about what awakening means, what it what it looks like for me. And, and I don't think that there's ever going to be a real solid definition. And I think it's going to vary person to person. But for me, it's a, it's been a process of trying to figure out what's real and things that aren't and, and a process of weeding out toxic and old habits that aren't serving me and that hold me back. Yeah, but they served us so damn good earlier in life. I can, I can think back on my, my marriage early on. I can think back on my relationships with uh, members of my faith community, and I wanted them to see certain things about me, and I did not want them to see my my dark spaces. and And I also realized, like, there are parts of me, like, I want to be myself, but maybe I'm not acceptable to people, including my own spouse, if I'm if I if I'm trying to be myself. Like, I want to hide, I want to shield. And as you point out, like, we get into this this end of life, and it just doesn't serve the same purpose, and it just doesn't even feel like it's what we want to do. Absolutely. I was thinking about that too. And I think there were some aspects where I knew that the behavior that I was portraying wasn't healthy, but I also didn't want to look at what that behavior was. So it's a hiding of your hiding. And <laughs> right, it, you, you would, if, if someone said, are you hiding yourself? You'd be like, no, no, I'm not hiding myself. Yeah. You'd be like, what you see is what you get. All the while I've got, you know, 20 different masks on, 20 different layers of things that I never wanted people to see or know about me. Mm, what happens when people, at the very beginning, when people start to see it and they call you on it, how, how does that make you feel? Start to see the, the change or start to see the shadow? Oh, when they start to see the shadow and they feel safe enough with you to tell you about them. Yeah. Um, originally, what's that, what's that do for you? Initially, super defensive and shut down and... <laughs> I mean, I can think of several experiences that we were, you know, same circles we were in. And looking back at it now, it's it's almost embarrassing. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. Um, there was a moment a couple months ago where I was in this fast food line with my wife. And my wife just looks at me and says, stop the bullshit. Just stop it. And all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a minute. Let me tell you how <laughs> things are. Right. And the reality is, like, she nailed it. I was I was just bullshitting. And and. We get to this part in our life where we just want to stop bullshitting because we're healthier if we can be honest and vulnerable and transparent to the degree that the people around us are safe to let us do that. There's still a there's still a, a holding back when we're not around safe people. And to various degrees, all of us have to still shield a little bit. We don't get to just be our full self all the time or even in any given moment. But yeah, it it we certainly want. At some point here, we just like, okay, I want to stop fitting in. I want to stop faking myself to fit in. I want to start to belong. I just want to be me and be acceptable to the world. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one experience that comes to mind that you, you talk about us, we need to feel safe within our group and we still kind of gauge where we're at with certain people. Um, do you remember the time a couple of months ago we were at a party and you made a comment about how your IQ was better than mine? <laughs> so okay um all right audience we're we're already going there i'm already feeling my the little heat sensation <laughs> in my chest um because i didn't know we were going there today but let's do it so we were at a party good party we're in the second floor of this this uh, giant office building on this like main uh, street in downtown uh, southern utah and i'm up on top uh, we're just having a good time there's probably 20 people in this place just rocking it out just a good adult party and we were making some jokes and i was wanting to establish i'm smart to the people around me 
And I'm also trying to throw you a bone, but I do it in the way that I'm like, hey, Mikkel, you know, other than, other than me, you're like the smartest person in the room. Something like that. I don't remember exactly what I said. Do you remember the exact words? No, but it was something like that. Something like that. And you immediately, it was like, I don't remember if you like grabbed me by my throat or it was my collar <laughs> or what, but you took me aside and you were like, Bill. I wasn't very nice about it. Like I did it in oh, front of everybody. Oh, no, I needed it. Oh, I needed it. That was perfect. I loved it. But to be honest, in the moment, I loved it. Um, my body went like, ooh, don't do this. And my my shadow side said like, oh, let me shield. Let me protect. Let me let me laugh it off. Let me make excuses. But deep down, I'm to the point in my life, and I, and I think you and I both do this. It's like, okay, like don't catch me in my worst moment, but generally speaking, I want to deal with this stuff. Yeah. So so I, you took me aside by my collar or my throat, or I don't remember exactly. <laughs> and and you said essentially like, you don't need to f and do this. You don't need to. You don't need to establish your intelligence. Just be you. And if you're smart, if you're that damn smart, it'll just it'll just carry itself. You don't need to show people that. Um, and it put me in my place. And I realized like, ooh. Ooh, I did several things there. One was my ego tried to make me like superior to the room. And then the other half of it was like, I wanted to honor that you're smart, but there was just a little piece of me that's like, I, but I, I want to also establish like I'm smarter. And that, that was just bullshit. Yeah, it, it was a good experience for me, um, again, because I think we have this dynamic and I feel like you're one of the safest people for me to be who I am. And so I love this ability that we have to be able to call each other out on our shit. But you know exactly when it's okay to do that for me. And I'm still learning what that process looks like for you. I'm just calling you out all the time. No, I don't think you've ever missed the mark. I don't think you've ever done it. And I walked away going like, I don't like her anymore. I'm done. (laughs) I just don't, I don't want to be around her. No, I've never done that. So I think you've also picked the right moments to, to tackle that. Um, Man, I'm, it's, it's impressive because you're right. We, we live in a community of people who want to be authentic and vulnerable. And we spend almost every weekend with these people. And they're, they're, again, none of us are perfectly authentic, perfectly vulnerable. But these are the best people you're going to find at it. And to sit in that space when we mess up and to have someone else come up to you and go like, hey, you messed up. You messed up. And here's why you messed up. And you, you got to see it. it, it, man, it becomes almost, almost a life force to do that kind of work and to go like, oh, I'm like, I'm like digging into stuff that I've held on to for 20 years and, and I'm letting it go and I'm becoming a much more well-rounded human being. Yeah. I love that. I think for me, part of the process of my awakening and, and my journey has been the people that love me while I'm deep in my shadow um, and their continued acceptance of me, even when they've seen me at my worst. Um, I think that that makes a huge difference in my willingness to continue to being vulnerable and seeing my shadow, but also being able to return that love and that acceptance for other people. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Do you remember, do you remember about a year ago? I mean, the first time I met a couple of our friends was, we were at Chris and Don's house. We were having a a get together, and Kelsey and I. Oh, what I should say, I should say, audience, you're not going to know who Chris and Don are, but sometime, sometime in the next year, you're going to know who Chris and Don are. Yeah, but we were at their house, and it was Kelsey and I were breaking up that night. She had she had told me. Um, she Wait a minute, you're a lesbian. Yeah. Oh my goodness! <laughs> I didn't even know that. That's the best part of this story. <laughs> So Kelsey and I are breaking up, right? And and she didn't want to she didn't want to talk about things before we went to the get together. Um, and I insisted. I kept pushing, and so she just drops this bomb on me, and we go to this party, and I got so drunk, so wasted because I just didn't want to feel, and I was so upset. And Guys, she's not kidding. When she says drink a lot, I mean she she like the moment she got there, she sits down with the group. It's like. The hell with all of you people. I am going to drink a ton. Yeah. And I, prior to that, was still learning what my alcohol tolerance was, right? So I didn't right, know. Right. You were like, a newbie. Yeah. I didn't know what my level was. When two bottles t- ain't it. Yeah. When too much was too much. <laughs> and I just pushed it. I just 
kept going. And again, I don't even know most of the people in the room. And I didn't, I didn't care. So I get so wasted. And I go outside and Chris and Don have got this cat, Kevin, right? Kevin the cat. Kevin the cat. Kevin and Kevin the cat and I have a special bond because he probably right. saved my life that night. But do you like I look at the person that I was then and the person that I am now and it's almost I feel like two completely different people. And so it, it for it's interesting for me to see that process because sometimes I don't feel like I'm that much different until I compare myself to those experiences. Yeah, it's been fun to watch you grow those those early ons. Like, there's this compassion among our group that when you start, because we we all came out of this this group, we all came out of an unhealthy religious system, and uh, hanging out as adults and having an adult party where there's adult beverages is this new frontier for these people as they exit the system. And so it's not like, again, most of the audience uh, at some point when they listen to this, maybe maybe they're going to be uh, looking at it going like, man, why the hell are they just drinking for the first time? Well, that's the reason. And so as you try to get used to like, how does this work? This is this new ritual we're doing. And I don't know how much I can drink and have fun and how much I can drink and get way too crazy or get way too drunk. And, and so everybody's learning these things for the first time. I should say, by the way, if you want to hang out with us, you can't be the person who drinks too much every time. Like this group will give you compassion to do that a few times, um, but everybody's got to figure out how to manage it. And I'll tell you, man, look, watching you the last six months, Mikkel, um, it just feels like you're in the zone. Like every time you're at a party, you just seem to be in that really good space. And I just, I love being around you. That's why you're one of my best friends. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I've figured out, I've figured out how to, manage and I figured out what that sweet spot is you know where I'm buzzed but not wasted because right if you're it's no fun not remembering no and if you're one of those people who just drinks too much every party to be honest man people just don't think that's pretty cool so no. just just dial it down like dial it down find the nice zone yeah be funny be outgoing but uh, if you're sleeping in someone else's bed at the end of the night that's really not cool that's not cool so, Bill, like, what what started your awakening process? So, um, for me, it's been probably so. I'm 40 years old. I'll turn 41 here shortly, and uh, probably from the age of about 30. So, 10 years, maybe. This has kind of been an ongoing process. And what I realized was I was in a system, Mikkel, where, uh, and, and again, you're in the same system, so you know this. But we're saying this more for the listener. I was in a system where my responsibility was to sacrifice my individuality in order to make the system and the group look good. And so my job was to put my best face on and say the right words and signal to the other members of the group that I was doing this thing the right way. And at some point when I turned 30, 29, 30, 31, somewhere in there, I had had enough of that. It wasn't working anymore. I felt... Uh, I felt like a person who was claustrophobic and stuck inside an elevator. Uh, it felt suffocating. And I realized like, wait a minute, I'm, I'm doing this thing. And you don't even like, it's not even a conscious thing. You don't even understand the process well enough to name it. But you realize like when I try to sacrifice myself and fit in, it doesn't feel good. When I am more myself but also making my group uncomfortable, that feels better. And so you start to edge into, at least I did, I start to edge into just like, okay, I'm going to start holding pieces of my own ground. I'm going to start to just be myself in certain areas and see what happens. And you could feel other people get uncomfortable, but you also felt like this liberation inside yourself. And so 10 years ago, the process started and it was so slow, little bit by little bit, day by day, week by week, I would choose to go like, okay, I'm going to show a little bit more of myself. I'm going to expose a little bit more of who I am to the world around me. And I'm going to just see who is okay with that and who isn't. 
Uh, and that process, again, we've been doing this for a decade. And, and so um, I, I can't ever look back at any of those early moments and say like, oh, I figured it out. Like this is what was going on. No, it, it's almost not until maybe the last three years, four years that I've really had the vocabulary to describe kind of what's happening. That sounds very similar to my own experience. I was thinking about it the other day. Like, it's it's not just one minute you wake up and, and you're almost awake, right? It's It's a gradual process. And I was thinking about the experiences that kind of led me to where I'm at today. And, you know, one of them was when I was about 27, 28, I had a near drowning experience. And my experience was not like... You, you, it was not like what I had anticipated or what I had always been taught that death would be. Um, and so that started asking, I started asking myself questions and um, never finding a real answer or an answer that felt good to me. And as I continued to think about that experience, um, it just, like you said, it just, I wasn't fitting in, but I didn't realize how much I had been trying to fit in and how unhappy that had made me and was continuing to make me. And so I did I did the exact same thing. I just started exposing more of myself and holding a little bit more ground for myself. And it's super scary as you do that, right? Oh, I ha- oh my goodness, yes. Because, because your whole community might reject you and you might not have anybody left to go to. Right. And as I started to do that, as I started to hold my own ground and start pushing back a little bit, I did. I started losing friends. Um, People within my faith community looked at me differently. Um, Some stopped associating with me. And that feeling, like you, I, I loved how you described that. It's scary, but it also feels very liberating because you're you're taking back pieces of you that you had given away to everybody else. Mm. And. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm just, I'm sitting with that for a second. Like, yes. Like it felt like the great, like if I look back at my life now, the greatest thing in the world was that I took back my individuality. Yeah. Who you are as a person, but also the power that you gave the system or other people. And, and you start for me, I started learning to trust myself when my intuition said, you know, that's not the safest person. I started trusting that and I stopped giving other people my voice and the power to make decisions for me. And it's, it's been an amazing journey, not always easy, scary, feels unsettled. It's new, but also like I am the happiest I've ever been in my entire life. Yeah. It, it, takes me to wanting to say one thing, but also to preface to the audience that at some point in the next, whatever, 20 episodes, first 20 episodes here, we'll tell the story of how you and I met and, and why we've become best friends. But the, the reality becomes this idea that if you find someone else, if you find someone else that is safe to be your most authentic self. And again, I want to preface that saying, and maybe I'm using all these words too many times. I want that, that you can never be 100% vulnerable, authentic, transparent. The world isn't designed that way. It's, it's part of being a human being is that we always have to hide a little piece of ourselves. But when you can go from hiding all of you to hiding almost none of you because you find these safe people, and it's so hard to find them, to find one person who's safe that you can go to lunch with once a month and you can just like hang around and go like, okay, I'm going to just show you as much of myself as I can. And it's okay. And yet in this community, you know, you and I, the reason you as a lesbian and me as this nerdy homo or sorry, I almost said that (laughs) as, as this nerdy heterosexual male, uh, the reason we're best friends is because we've deemed early on, like that person's safe. I can be my authentic self and that person's not going anywhere. They're going to sit right here in this space with me. And man, it's just been fun. And then to find other people. Yeah. Like our, Oh, go ahead. Brene Brown says that you're lucky if you find, you know, three to five people that you can be yourself with yeah. to, to look at our community and have 
a variety of different people. I think our core group is what, 14? 14. Yep. It's like, I, I have no words. I have no words. It's that hashtag blessed, you know? Hashtag blessed. Um, we ought to note, we, we hope that listeners, are as they listen to this podcast over multiple episodes, that they'll start to sense how important this process is and look for a community themselves. Um, but I say that with acknowledgement that while we're at 14, and we'll probably get into this in the next couple of episodes, but we want to talk about the book Sapiens and how how human beings do in terms of size of groups and what mechanisms work. We're probably at the high end of the number that we can have. That If we go any more than 14, the closeness of the group begins to break down. Um, and so, so I'm not, I'm not saying like, Hey, we're going to get to 50 cause I, that's not going to happen. Uh, this process is difficult in order to have intimacy, connection, safety, vulnerability, transparency, authenticity, to have those be the core concepts of your friend group. Your group cannot be 30, 40, 50 people. And, and we're, we're just damn lucky that we've gotten to 14 and it is the 14 best people on the planet, in my opinion, at least 13 others. Uh, myself, maybe, maybe not, but there's this idea that all 14 of us are just good human beings. They are. And I love how our group continues to show up for each other in ways that I never had experienced before. You know, um, my wedding, for example, our, our friend group took over the entire event, managed everything, prepared all the food, did all of the decorating, um, came over before the wedding, because we, we got, Kelsey and I got married at our house and set everything up and then let us leave. And they took everything down, put food away, cleaned. Like, who does that? Yeah. We, we used to be part of a community where people served each other if you fit the mold. And the moment you didn't fit the mold, like, they didn't want anything to do with you. And so you had this help at this younger stage when you were fitting in. They'd show up and help you move. And then when you lose that, when you say, like, like, I'm claiming my individuality back, I'm leaving this community, and you're like, but wait a minute, maybe nobody will help me anymore. Right. Nobody's going to show up. And the reality is that when you find those people, they show up. Yeah, they do. It's pretty amazing. So I was thinking again, Bill, just the process of my own awakening. And one of the things that I, I think made a big role is asking questions. What are your thoughts on that? Like asking yourself questions and, and allowing yourself to think. So in every process of working out conflict or working out difference between me and other uh, individuals, when I say something or do something that runs counter to who that other person is. In other words, in my healthiest self, I'm still going to butt heads with someone else's healthiest self. When that happens, the old mechanism was like, let me defend myself. Let me, let me, um, justify. Right. And, And what I've turned to Mikkel is that I've turned to like, let me sit with just for a moment. Let me sit with what I did. And am I, is there some truth to what I did was not healthy And so I start to ask those questions. The other questions you start to do, once you let go of the certainty that your prior system offered you, you now want to know how the universe works. And whereas you used to be overjoyed at having the answers, you now enter a space of life where if someone just has the answer, that's no fun at all. Like, let's have questions and let's not have any really great answer. Let's, let's have lots of great answers or no really great answer. And let's just wrestle with big questions and let's let everybody share their two cents and see if there's anything that I can learn from their difference rather than being overjoyed at our, uh, at our similarity or the certainty of our collective agreement. Um, and, and so questions become for me, huge. I'd love to know like questions for you, like how have questions played out in your life? Yeah. It, I just started asking myself similar questions. Like, why am I feeling this way? What does it mean about me? 
And why do I feel the need to either be defensive or to feel justified or to think that the other person is is wrong? And so, like, even last night, okay, you're, you and Amanda had been over. We'd had dinner. We're sitting outside. And yesterday was kind of a rough day with kids. And uh, uh, I love my children, but I kind of oh, hate kids. I love my children, but I'm, I'm with you. Um, <laughs> we've got, I, I say this to you a lot. Um, I've decided I don't want to have any kids. They're not taking it very well. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's, it's hard on them. It is. It's hard for them. They don't. They don't want to leave, but you know, yesterday was a rough day with kids and, and for some reason, and I'm still like sitting with this and trying to figure this out. I think in my head that the way that I do things is the most right. As far as kids go, even though Kelsey's got a a way with kids that's different than mine. And most of the time it works, but there are a few times where, and, and I can admit that my way doesn't always work either, but there are a few times when the things that she's doing, I can see are not, it's not working the way that I want them to in my head. And, but even me being able to say that a year ago, I would never have been able to say that. I would never have been able to acknowledge that my way's not always right, or even acknowledge that I have these, these feelings that I'm trying to find the words. You wouldn't, you wouldn't have been able to express your frustration that it wasn't working. I wouldn't have been able to express, but also I wouldn't have been able to acknowledge that why do I feel like I have to be right? Yeah. And be able to sit with that, you know? I would have just, I would have gotten defensive and mad, and I would have manipulated the situation so that Kelsey felt bad, and then she'd eventually do things the way that I wanted her to. And just even that process of of asking myself, okay, why, why do I feel the need to be right, and why do I feel the need to be justified. Why can't I just let things? Yeah, it becomes, it becomes interesting because you sit with yourself and you're like, oh, I see what I'm doing. I see what I'm doing. That's, that's not real. Like I'm just, there's this extra layer of reasoning I'm adding for the other person to see. But the reality of what I'm doing, the the real reason for what I'm doing is one layer pulled back. Now here's the other thing. Not only do you start to see that, but the people around us are so developed that they're also sitting quietly knowing that we're that we're putting mechanisms out front and it's not the reality. So the other day, uh, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was that happened. Um, oh, you, you acknowledged to Kelsey that there are times where you are saying something, hoping that that saying it and sharing it gets her to change what she wants to do. Like, instead of doing this, I'll stay home because... Mikel is lonely or Mikel is yeah. not wanting to be by herself, right? So the, the experience is Kelsey's going on a five, six day backpacking trip, right? And I couldn't get work off. I, I'm working in a new job and couldn't get the time off. And the plan was I was hoping that I could have uh, Friday off of work so that I could go up to Sunstone with, with you and the rest of the gang. Um, but I found out a couple of days ago that I have a mandatory in-service training, staff training. So I have to be there Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And so, you know, I, I had thought that, okay, I'll, I can stand being without Kelsey for a few days, but like six days, that's a long time. And so I did, I texted you and I texted Kelsey almost the same message. Like, I'm going to be, I, I can't go to Sunstone. Sad face. And in saying that, I had secretly hoped that you would feel sad and be like, oh, let's see what we can do to work things out and so that you can come. And I had secretly hoped that Kelsey would be like, oh, babe, I can't, like, that's way too long for you to be by yourself. I'll just not go. All the while knowing that's not what I really want. That's not healthy. Your ego wants that though. Right, right. But your healthy side doesn't want that. Your healthy side wants other people to be happy and do the things they need to do. And the things that they want to do. Yeah, and the things they want to do. Yes. So, yeah, there's this process of, like, I know I know the, the behavior. I see how I'm trying to twist and manipulate things. And that's not what I want. So recognizing the unhealthy coping mechanism and the unhealthy manipulation. But, you know, I wouldn't have been able to say that six months ago. 
No. And the other thing that now is safe to say was I remember Kelsey looked at you and said, I already knew that you, that's what you were doing. Yeah. Like, right. Like, so the, once you find developed human beings who are safe around you, they see your mechanisms sometimes even before you see it. And, and certainly they see it and they'll let you, they'll let you play it out to the degree that you need to, to protect yourself. And as the situation is safe, they're going to let you know, like, Hey, I saw that it wasn't healthy. There's a better way to do things. And here's the battle between your healthy side and your ego. And it was fun to watch that kind of play out. And that happens. I was chuckling as it happened because I've done that a thousand times myself. Um, this podcast isn't about us picking on each other. This podcast is about you and I talking about what it means to be human so that, so that people listening can start to get a feel for like, oh, there's a better way to do this. And we don't know the best way. It's the whole reason we're almost awakened. Right. And what works for me doesn't work for somebody else. And so it's a process of the listener going on their own journey and figuring out what works and what feels best for them. Yeah. Yeah. What kinds of awakening is there? So there's, I, I did some research because that's one of the things that I love to do. And there, it varies. But what I found were, it was interesting. Um, one is awakening of the mind. And this is, you just start, I think, doing this, some of the things that we did, just asking yourself questions and seeing how you may not fit in whatever situation or system that you're in. And one website that I found says that usually that's triggered by some type of suffering. So some some traumatic event happens, either a near-death experience for you, or a, you lose a family member, or you, know, you, you go through some life-altering illness, some type of traumatic event. And that that realization is what, like, you realize that this is not what I want for my life. And it's kind of starts you on that journey. And then after awakening of the mind, you have this awakening of a new personality, you start shedding those old coping mechanisms, those defenses, the toxic coping, and you start developing this level of self acceptance, realizing that you are who you are, because of your shadows and because of the good parts of you too. And I think that that's something that we, at least in the beginning, I had thought that I could get rid of. I could someday get rid of all of my shadows, right? But that's never going to happen. There, Certain things are always going to be a part of me. It's a process of developing healthier ways to um, maybe manage or at least see the shadow. And then after awakening of a new personality is awakening of spiritual energy where you just recognize your own individual life force. You know, I used to, I used to believe that God controlled everything, right? That I really didn't have a say in my own, my own life and the choices that I was making. And it's funny because over a year ago, I got a tattoo and my tattoo is of the universe and it looks like it's coming out of my skin and the more i i see it the more i start to realize that i i do have the universe inside of me and so does everybody else we are our own gods if you will that's a that's a bad term um but you each person has their own individual life force and you get to direct and create and and be amazing yeah it um, as I think about all these kinds of awakening, the, the word existential crisis comes to mind, which is that something, as you point out, something traumatic has to happen. And I think generally when you run into another awakened person, they have, they almost always to a T have this interesting story to tell about how things used to be. And then something dramatic happened. And, and then suddenly it pushed them into waking up. And this idea of being awakened, as you, as you just said, we're never going to rid ourselves of all of our shadows. You and I were out to dinner the other night with a friend and this friend, he, and we'll have him on the podcast at some point too, just like he says the wisest stuff. He, he says the smartest things and he's telling us like how to sit with our shadow, how to sit with hurt when someone else, we feel like someone else has caused us some hurt. 
and he's giving us like this deep Buddhist shit. And all of a sudden, two thirds of the conversation, his wife uh, leans over and says, the two of them are still fighting all the time. Yeah. Right. And so I'm looking over at him and I'm like, you seem to have this thing figured out and you're still don't have it figured out. Like, why the hell am I going to put years and years of energy into trying to figure it out? It seems like it's impossible. And, and he agreed, like it is impossible, but you get to hold a bigger and bigger space for the tension of all of us humans kind of bumping into each other. And you get to respond and react healthier and healthier when that happens. And who doesn't really, I mean, again, some people don't want to go there. Right. But on this side of things, who doesn't want to go there? Yeah, I like I like being pushed. I like continuing to evaluate. And I think one of the most profound things that I learned from that dinner was his his comment about you're going to feel these emotions, the emotions that we often try to get rid of or push away. He said, you're going to feel these emotions off and on for the rest of your life. And that was huge. Mm. Yeah, you're not fixing it. You're not, you're not solving the entire problem. You're, you're taking bites out of the elephant, but there's always going to be a piece of the elephant left. Right, right. And the he recommended a book, Bill, and I know that you've been listening to it and you're way further along than I am, but the book already free. And one of the comments that I, I just really have loved from that book is he, the author, Bruce Tift, who is a, he's a licensed marriage and family therapist, but he studies Buddhism and, and incorporates both of those into his practice. He said, we're living in the past as if it were the present. And I think that that's been such a huge concept for me to try and grasp because I think we, we do, we go from our past experiences and bring those into the future or, you know, into the present moment and try and make a decision. And that's not the best. We have to, we have to stay present. Yeah. If you're sensing you're not awakened or you're sensing you've started to awaken, or maybe you're where we are, where you're almost awakened. I think you're going to enjoy the podcast. We're going to recommend books to you all the time, things that we're listening to, things that will be helpful. Uh, As Mikkel just pointed out, already free. Bruce Tift is the author. The subtitle is Buddhism Meets Psychotherapy on the Path to Liberation. And what, what our friend at dinner was talking about was the very thing that this guy just hits on chapter after chapter, which is this idea, which is, you know, whatever frustration, whatever tension you're carrying to, to learn better ways to just sit with it rather than telling a story about it and then reacting to people like, hey, you did this to me again, and now you're coming out in this attack on someone when there's other ways to kind of sit with it and go like, oh, something felt inside me different. It, it didn't feel good. Let me sit with that and let me see what happens. And, and we end up just becoming healthier human beings as we interact with others. So I think the listener is really going to love... If you, if you hear us recommend books, and as the conversation around those books seems interesting to you, you can check out our website at almostawakened.org. That's almostawakened.org. There is a, a resource page there. There's a bookstore there. You can check out the books that we are reading or have read. We are going to put this book up there. It's not there at the moment, but we will add this one. So by the time you see it, it should be there. Um, but uh, we hope that you can just see the conversations around humanity and development uh, and all these types of awakening that Mikkel pointed out. We hope these are going to be helpful to you. So, um, Bill, yes, one of the things that uh, you and Kelsey joke about that you learned from the dinner, you know, last week, was that last week, yeah. is the terrorist in the cockpit. Tell me about that. The terrorist in the cockpit. So our good friend Thomas... Uh, sat with us at dinner and he's telling us how to uh, sit with our sensations. And so let's give an example. So my wife um, says a joke about me in, in public to the point where she's trying to get people to laugh, but it just poked me. It hurt. It felt uh, embarrassing. It felt shameful. Right. And so I'm already putting names to it. It's embarrassing. It's shameful. Uh, I'm angry. I'm sad. And what Thomas said was when these experiences happen, and again, let's recognize like there are people in the world who intentionally want to hurt us. That happens. 
But most of the people in our, of our loved ones aren't really wanting to hurt us. Like it comes out, it happens, but their motives aren't, aren't evil. And so as we have these interactions with people, friends and loved ones, and they do something that rubs the wrong way. Like beef jerky? His, like beef jerky, which may be a story we tell at some point too, <laughs> but that's going to be an inside joke for now, listeners. Um, the, the whole thing was that, okay, so I get poked by my wife. She makes fun of me. She does it to get a laugh out of the crowd. It, it just, it, it doesn't do that with me. It hurts to sit with like, okay, I have a sensation inside me and that sensation I can say like, okay, it's a, it's a tightness in my belly. It's a tightness in my chest, whatever it is. And to sit with it on a sensation level, but the moment we name it, the moment we give it a story, you know, Amanda, which is my wife, Amanda, like you always do this. You always uh, say something in public that embarrasses me. The moment we give it a story, we are, we are already, as Thomas said, the, the terrorists are already in the cockpit. There's nothing you can do now because now you've already put the other person on defensive. Now they're going to come back and defend themselves. Now you're going to have to push harder and to get them to see that, hey, they hurt you. And you end up rather than like really wanting to sit and work out like, why did that happen? Why did you say that? Why did I feel that? It's now you were wrong and no, I wasn't. And you've already lost. You've already gone down the place of this is going to just not go well. This is going to go south. We, Somebody's going to get hurt. Yeah. You often say, don't go down the rabbit hole. Yeah. Yeah. Don't go down the rabbit hole because the moment you start to tell yourself a story and you withdraw from the people you care about because, oh my gosh, if I keep interacting with these people, I'm embarrassed. It's embarrassing. I feel shame. You've already lost. And what you don't realize is the moment you re-enter the conversation with healthy dialogue and a healthy perspective, almost every time the problem disappears within 60 seconds. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, human behavior, and as we get into a thousand different ways us humans behave, human behavior is fascinating. Some of it we see, like it makes sense. And some of it, it takes a ton of conversation to expose why we do the things the way we do. Yeah. I was thinking the other day, I was on my drive home from work. I should have been a behavioral psychologist or something because I think watching people is so fascinating. And it's it's fascinating to me to watch people's body language and pick up on cues that they're giving, most likely subconsciously, but as they feel uncomfortable in certain situations. I was just thinking earlier when I did the self-deprecating humor of there's 14 friends that are awesome. And then I said, well, maybe 13, not me. Yeah. I noticed that that was, that was shadow too. Like there was something going on there where I felt the need to put everybody else above and deep down inside. That's not really what I was trying to do. Yeah. So we all do this stuff. And so I hope that as listeners, if you just keep, keep tuning in, keep checking out the almost awakened podcast, that you're going to get a chance to kind of dig into yourself and begin to see others in a different light. And it's going to help a ton in the relationships you have with those around you. Hey, Bill, I think it would be really cool if we could get listeners to either write in via email or whatever and tell us kind of what's what triggered them about this podcast and, and maybe why. And let's kind of explore some of those aspects together. I think that that would be really fascinating. Yeah. So listeners, if you want to contact us, you can email us at almostawakenedpodcast at gmail.com. So almostawakenedpodcast at gmail.com. If you can't remember all of that, again, it's a long word, but it's three words, no big deal. But if for whatever reason you can't figure that out, go to almostawakened.org.org and there will be a little blip there that says to contact us, email us at this email address and you can reach us that way. Share with us positive and negative. Share with us things that, you know, critique us by all means. Also share things you want us to go into or or good ideas for new topics to discuss. Uh, We probably have in mind maybe 50, 60 things that I think we can cover without even having to think again about another subject. But we would love to know what you'd like us to talk about. And we'd like to try to to, um, encompass that in, in our dialogue. 
Absolutely. And books that you're reading, podcasts that you're listening to, you know, your own process of self-development, what tools that you're using and what tools have helped you in your journey. And if for whatever reason you think like you've got an interesting story, you've got something cool to share, you think that you've got examples in your life that would uh, make for an interesting conversation, we'd also like to do interviews along the way as well. And so by all means, reach out to us on, uh, on that level too. Absolutely. So Bill, what do you think our next episode's going to be on? Um, I wonder if we should maybe tackle Sapiens next and uh, talk a little bit about what what has bound tribes together at various times in uh, humanity over the last 200,000 years. And maybe then people can begin to sense like what worked and what didn't, why it worked and why it didn't, um, and have a conversation about why the numbers of a tribe need to be at certain points for certain binding mechanisms to work. Sounds awesome. I can't wait.